Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. And yes, I have implemented casual Fridays here at Electrified. We got a report from Bloomberg that Tesla has reduced production in China, according to people familiar with the matter. Tesla earlier this month instructed employees in Shanghai to lower production of the Y and the 3. They're moving to working five days per week instead of the usual six and a half days. The production lines run on two 11 and a half hour shifts per day, which remains unchanged. Output has been trimmed starting earlier this month and the staff has not been given a clear indication of when production will go back to normal. Context for the overall auto market in China is always important. The passenger vehicle sales increased 17% in the first two months of the year. NEV sales rose 37.5%. For Tesla China, year over year, their wholesale sales are down 6%, but their domestic sales are up 15%. That is largely thanks to the unwinding of the wave, however. Some of the production lines at Tesla's Shanghai plant, including the battery workshops, are subject to longer suspensions. Tesla has told staff and some suppliers to be prepared for extended production limits through April. So far, Elon has not denied this report. We've said all year the competition in China is for real, and last year in 2023, Tesla and BYD were operating at near 100% utilization rates for its factories, while a majority of the auto industry in China was well below 100%. This may be somewhat unusual for Tesla, but looking at the entire industry, it's certainly not unprecedented. If we assume Giga Shanghai slows down for one month, going down to five days a week from six and a half is about a 23% reduction. Assuming Tesla China does roughly 75,000 units per month, if you take 23% off of that, that would be losing roughly 17.3,000 units units of production, ceteris paribus. The Chinese car companies are the most competitive car companies in the world. I think they will have significant success outside of China, depending on what kind of tariffs or trade barriers are established. Frankly, if there are not trade barriers established, they will pretty much demolish most other car companies in the world. They're extremely good. In a Brad Sloan video, about 370 Cybertrucks were spotted at Giga Texas, to which Elon said production is ramping. The real question becomes, when will Tesla remove the Cybertruck from the other cars category so we can have the specific breakdown? I do think it may happen as soon as later this year, once it would surpass typical Model S and X sales. You may recall initially there was chatter that Tesla was only gonna sell about a thousand Foundation Series Cybertrucks, but given they may do around 3,000 in quarter one, I think they're going to comfortably exceed that number. I'm not at all trying to argue I think Tesla's Q1 margins will be good. Let's just say I'm curious to see how things play out with the high price of the Cybertruck, but also with all of the costs that Tesla will be moving into COGS for the quarter. There's certainly a lot of new machinery that's required to make this beast, but come quarter three or quarter four, I have some hope that the Cybertruck could be margin accretive for Tesla. That learn about the Model Y video from Tesla on X ended up being pretty basic. However, it was well done and Brenda was enjoyable to listen to. So if you need a video to share with friends or family members, she does cover a fair amount of features on the Model Y. So I'll have the video below if you want to bookmark it. Yes, Giga Wiper did eventually get that last little bit of snow off as well. A quick sympathy strike check-in for Tesla in Sweden for quarter one. They're still the top brand with 22.1% market share with just a 265 unit lead over Volvo. With all of the opposition Tesla's facing in Sweden right now, I find this fairly impressive. Robert Scoble, who's big in the AI space, said Tesla AI is very underrated. If you think Elon has competition, you're simply wrong. There is none mainly referring to FSD. Elon said, yeah, 99% of people have no idea and improvement will accelerate dramatically now that we are no longer AI training compute constrained. This is a first for Tesla in a long while. In my opinion, the most likely reason this is now the case, that NVIDIA H100 cluster is now fully online. It first went online in August of 2023, but it takes some time to get it fully set up and running. There's always the looming possibility that Do 
Dojo begins playing an increased role in Tesla's compute. Don't forget Tesla's spending $1 billion on Dojo by the end of this year, 500 million of which is going to set up Dojo at Giga New York. A third one that goes overlooked, Elon did say on X January 26th this year that Tesla will buy from AMD as well. Elon's answer yes was in response to the question, any plans to buy any chips from AMD? So that could be something for the future. Now, all we really have to do is wait and see what this accelerated progress really looks like. I'd argue the most impressive thing here and something that I feel like goes overlooked when this conversation comes up, it's not just about the amount of raw compute that a company can gather, at the end of the day, it's really only as good as the data that it's training. So if you have one AI company training like one petabyte of data compared to Tesla, those are very different animals. Tim Zaman, ex-Tesla engineer said, due to real world video training, we may have the largest training data sets in the world, hot tier cache capacity beyond 200 petabytes, orders of magnitudes more than LLMs. Further, when it comes to Tesla's infrastructure, he said, it's all on the premises, all owned by Tesla. Many organizations say we have, which usually means we rented, very few companies actually own, and therefore fully vertically integrate. This bothers me because owning and maintaining is hard, renting is easy. The TLDW, I would argue Tesla has the best data set in the world when it comes to autonomy and it's continually growing. We now pair that with the fact that they are no longer compute constrained and as we've been saying, things should be incredibly interesting over the next six months. Most of us here like data, so have a listen to this. According to a recent study done by N. Haynes, nearly one third of the US population is at risk for at least one vitamin deficiency or anemia. 95% of adults have an inadequate vitamin D intake. 45% of the US population had inadequate vitamin A, 46% for vitamin C, 84% for vitamin E, and 15% for zinc. We've talked in the past about all of the terrible things that nutrient deficiencies can actually lead to. At a recent congressional event, we had a physician say, this mantra that Americans get all the nutrients they need from food is simply not true and the data demonstrates it's false. It's much harder than you think to get the nutrients you need from food alone. Soil depletion, pesticides, processed food, the reasons go on and on. It's pretty simple. That's my TED talk on why I take AG1 and why I've allowed them to sponsor the channel. It's a quick and easy way that I think tastes good to get a baseline of daily nutrients. You can take it in the morning or at night, or you can sip it throughout the day. As you can see, I like to sip mine throughout the day. AG1 does the third party testing. They have a killer team with Huberman and Atia on board. And just one scoop gives you all 75 five of these vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. If you wanna support the channel and more importantly, your own health, you can go to drinkag1.com slash electrified linked below. Using my link or the QR code on the screen, you'll get five travel packs and a one year supply of vitamin D3, K2 for free. According to the data, there's a lot of you out there that could really benefit from something like AG1. Monroe Live was asking about a high voltage open connector that they found on the Cybertruck. Wes, a Cybertruck engineer, quote posted something saying don't forget you can always check the service documentation the post that Wes shared was a picture from the service manual and that user said inductive charging I'll take that as a pretty good indication the Cybertruck is future proofed for inductive charging so that open port would just be for a coil or a plate to be later installed so when you drive over one of the wireless chargers you're good to go it should be noted some automakers will leave open connectors like that for general assembly purposes so they can do some testing if need be, but sounds like in this case, it will have a further purpose at Tesla. Drew Baglino also replied to Wes with some eyeballs, so I'll also take that as a confirmation. In case you're new, last year, Tesla bought a company called Wyferian who did a lot of work with inductive charging, Later, Tesla sold off part of the company, presumably kept most of the IP and some employees. And since Tesla executives have said multiple times, Tesla is working on inductive charging for passenger vehicles. I'm sure this will wear off over time with me, but right now I actually enjoy plugging in my car each time because it's a reminder that I'm not at a gas station. 
The group behind that Pwn to Own event that Tesla has participated in every year when it comes to cybersecurity held another initiative and Tesla participated and it paid off. Ironically enough, Tesla will be paying off these hackers as they won $200,000 and a new Model 3. The team of security researchers dubbed Synactive managed to hack Tesla's ECU, electronic control unit, and the vehicle CAN bus. Typically we gloss over these events, but I think it's important to remember this is actually one of Elon's biggest fears when it comes to Tesla. Um, I, I think one of the biggest uh, risks for autonomous vehicles is somebody achieving um, a fleet-wide hack. Um, you know, in principle, if, if somebody was able to hack, say, all of the autonomous Teslas, they could say, I mean, just as a prank, they could say, like, send them all to Rhode Island <laughs> <laughs> from across the United States. <laughs> and they'll be like, well, okay, that would be the end of Tesla. <laughs> um, and <laughs> there'll be a lot of angry people in Rhode Island, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, we got to make super sure that, uh, that a fleet-wide hack is basically impossible and that if people are in the car that they have uh, override authority on uh, whatever the car is doing. So if the car is doing something wacky, uh, you can press a button that no amount of software can override that will ensure that the uh, you, you, you gain control of the vehicle. Tesla participating in initiatives like this helps to keep them ahead of the hacking curve. An X user was asking for clarification on the number of supercharger stalls that companies like Rivian and Ford have access to. Rohan Patel said it's actually just over 16,000 stalls that they have access to. An additional 11,000 are just for Tesla customers, mostly V2 stalls. Multiple stations being added every week and really our only limiting factor is utility interconnection, which takes too darn long. The treehouse protesters in Giga Berlin are looking to build more. A spokesperson for the group said, even if new requirements make it impossible for us to protest, we will stand in Tesla's way beyond May 20th and stay there. They also noted the group is planning to build more treehouses, saying we're in exactly the right place to prevent the interests of the Tesla group from being pushed through like that. The administrative court is currently on the side of the protesters, but the police department seems to be against this. For now, the police have filed a complaint. In a surprise vote, Maine's top environmental regulator rejected a proposed EV mandate. This would have closely mirrored California's mandate that at least 51% of new car purchases be electric by 2028 and 82% by 2032. However, the board received received around 1,800 comments from the people and nearly 84% were not in favor of the mandate. The reason, Maine is far too rural with far too few charging stations and many Mainers are also concerned about the reliability of these vehicles in the extreme cold. Listen, there are definitely still locations and certain use cases where an EV may not be the best choice, but for 84% to oppose something like this, clearly we need a lot more education. Given the uncertainty in the EV transition, Stellantis is laying off 400 salaried workers. These will mainly be positions in engineering, technology, and software at the HQ in Michigan. The cuts, effective March 31st, amount to about 2% of Stellantis's global workforce in engineering, tech, and software. Carlos Tavares is still saying that EVs cost 40% more to make than those that run on gas. And Stellantis confirmed they're planning to launch 18 new EVs this year, eight of those in North America. Honda is another company looking to save money as they transition to electric vehicles. They just said they're going to reduce dealership profit margins on new vehicles and make some other changes. They're planning on a 0.5% profit margin reduction, and obviously the dealers are not happy. I think Honda dealers anywhere but Canada should be feeling grateful though, because how about this? Honda Canada reportedly expects to reduce the profit margin its Canadian dealers earn on vehicle sales by up to 44%. In action, the Canadian Auto Dealer Association is going to fight with substantial legal, financial, and intellectual resources. The drumbeat continues as we have more auto execs ringing the alarm on Chinese EVs coming to the US. US. CareSoft, the Monroe competitor, has broken down over 30 different Chinese EVs as of late. One of those was the BYD Seagull, a vehicle that in China costs less than $10,000. A former GM executive who now works at CareSoft said the Seagull could be a clarion call for the rest of the auto industry. It's a significant event. 
I'm pretty sure the range on the Seagull is only around 190 miles, and I think the top speed's only around 80 miles per hour, but Carasoft did say that they found the Seagull to be efficiently and simplistically designed, engineered, and executed, but with unexpected quality and anticipated reliability. For what it's worth, Carasoft did say the company, BYD, still makes some money on the Seagull. The expectation, however, is that if BYD were ever to bring a vehicle like this to the United States, they would have to change it and it would most likely cost more. For example, the same vehicle is selling in Mexico for about $21,000. Tesla stock closed the day at $170.83, down 1.15%, while the NASDAQ was up 0.16%. It was another very low volume day for Tesla, trading about 22 million shares below the average 30 day volume, which also keeps coming down. For the week, Tesla stock was up 4.7%, but year to date, it's still down 31.7%. Don't forget, check out AG1 links below if you're interested. Sometimes one good decision can lead to a snowball of many more. Hope you guys have a safe and a wonderful weekend. Please like the video if you did. You can find me on X linked below. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.